welcome three people to the platform. Jane Seal on the far right, who's chairing this session. Donald Fitzpatrick from University College Dublin in the middle. And Arthur Ortega from Yahoo Europe at my end of the table. And Jane will manage proceedings from now on. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy this event. I am immensely pleased and immensely proud to be here today to open up proceedings for this um, interesting and important one day conference. And one of the reasons that I'm really proud is because it represents an important collaboration between two organisations that are close to my heart. The first being ALT, the Association for Learning Technology, and the second being the GIST Tech Disc Advising Service. And I think because we. You just take your mics on, you seem very quiet. Is that better? Is that better? I just need to shout. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, so I was saying that the, this conference has been organised by two important organisations, Alt and Tectus, that are close to my heart. And because these two organisations have got together, we have a room full of people that is varied, um, comes from all kinds of places, all kinds of disciplines, all kinds of sectors. But I think what that means is that we're all bringing different skills, different expertise to the table to really question this idea about how can technology help enhance digital inclusion. Um, and so what I'm looking forward to today, the speakers that you'll hear now will challenge you and think, get you to think about what does digital inclusion mean, what's the role of technology, but also that you will share in that challenging and that questioning um, as we go throughout the day. So what I wanted to do is to kind of share my thoughts on digital inclusion and the role of technology. Um, and I'm really proud of this title, so I hope you are, because in a sense what I'm trying to say is today is not about me, Donald, Arthur, anybody pretending to be some kind of magic fairy that waves a wand and says, I've got the magical solution, just twinkle your wand and exclusion is gone. Today is not about magical solutions. It's about us really thinking about some important challenges. So I'm really going to question the notion of magical fairies with the magical ones. And I'll give you some challenges to think about. Before I do, I, I need to just let you know where I'm coming from quickly so you can understand the position I'm taking. I did my PhD back in 1984-87 when the beautiful, beautiful BBC Micro still existed. I love it, still do. Because um, it's a really powerful tool for working with adults with severe learning disabilities. And I worked in long-term mental handicap hospitals, as they were called then, and in social services. And that's where my passion and my heart is. I moved on to work in assistive technology, working in rehab engineering, so I understand a bit of the techie speak, not a lot. Um, but um, three recent bits of work I've done that are really feed, going to feed into my challenges to you today. Um, one is a book I wrote on accessibility, kind of reviewing theory and practice and trying to link research, policy and practice. The other is a project called Lexpis, which is a very student-centred project um, that was getting disabled students in university to talk about their technology experiences. And my two colleagues today are going to run some really interesting <coughs> workshops on that, so I won't say much more. But I've also just completed some work for the Technology Enhanced Learning Research Programme, synthesising and reviewing what literature and research there is out there about digital inclusion. Um, I'm going to use that background and that experience to give you my challenges and my thoughts. So the first challenge, kind of linking into the title of today, is about what does rewiring mean in the sense of digital inclusion. What I want to challenge you to think about is what is digital inclusion? Because certainly coming from an accessibility background, inclusion has very often been thought about as access. And I think most of us are, are realising that digital inclusion is more about access to technologies, it's more about accessibility of technologies, although both of those are important. Some of us also talk about the kind of use that learners um, use technologies for, and that's important, but it's more than just thinking about inclusion being about being able to use technologies. 
Digital inclusion is about meaningful use, and what I would suggest to you is that one of the important challenges is who decides what's meaningful about technology use. One of the things that worries me is that too often it's us that decides and not the learners that decide. And certainly in the work that I've been doing with disabled students and users, very often they say, these people have got their ideas about what I should be doing with technology and what's important about my technology use, but actually I don't think like that. And for some learners and for some students, they will make some important decisions that could be the right decisions for them, which is, actually, I don't need to use technology for this particular situation. And I think that's really important to hold on to to think about. <coughs> meaningful use of who decides that. The other part of the title for today is about strategies, tools and techniques. And yes, they're important. But what I'm passionate about is, is moving beyond the tools, the, t the strategies and the techniques. Um, they are important and some of us today will be talking about gadgets and yes, they're interesting and they're important. But gadgets and tools on their own don't make digital inclusion practice. Um, and I think that's very important. So what today is about is practitioners and other people coming together to describe and share how they use the tools. And it's that how we use the tools that I think is important in terms of moving digital inclusion along and thinking about what we can do for our learners and our students. Um, and I think it's from that that the notion of best, best practice will be decided. And I, I will confess to you that I'm getting a little bit concerned about bodies <coughs> that produce beautiful published documents that say, here's, here's case studies of best practice, when actually all they are are case studies of only practice, of sole practice, the person who's trying something out new for the first time. And that's really important, but it doesn't necessarily make it best practice. And I think it's all of us together today that will decide what's best practice in terms of using tools with our learners. <coughs> practice involves all stakeholders. That's why today is really exciting, because we've got all stakeholders in the room, um, across sectors and so on. But also practice is interdisciplinary. And you'll hear that a lot. Everybody likes to talk about interdisciplinary, but actually interdisciplinary work is really hard. And we shouldn't underestimate that. So I suppose that is a plea for these words are important, but I think we're start, starting to be a bit too glib. The notion of stakeholders interdisciplinary. Let's think about that, seriously engage with it in terms of what it means for digital inclusion and best practice. Finally, my last slide, the notion of barrier-free learning. Again, barrier-free learning is a phrase that's been around for a long time. Um, and I want to apply it to the notion of kind of getting us to think about notions of success and notions of failure in terms of digital inclusion, in terms of the things we try to do with learners using technology. Um, how do we decide whether our efforts are successful? And perhaps more importantly, who decides? One of the things I, I comment on in my digital inclusion report for the TAL programme is the idea that very often funders who are generous and give us money for big digital inclusion projects have notions of success and are very often linked to if we give you technology for your students in your college, in your school, in your community um, placement, our notion of success is that those learners must go on to higher education, further education, or get a job. And if they don't, the project's been a failure. Um, and actually, that disempowers the users of the technology, who sometimes come into schools, colleges, centres, with notions of that they want to use technology for something, but they're not thinking about further educational jobs. They have other goals, other outcomes that are important to them. It could be about staying in contact with grandma in Australia. It could be about developing their confidence. It could be about learning skills so they can help their children with their homework. Whatever it is, those outcomes are important for them. And if they're achieved, then perhaps that's success. And so I think part of today might be about challenging notions of success. My final point is, can we tolerate perceived failures? Um, technology costs a lot of money, costs a lot of time, um, uses up a lot of enthusiasm, patience, etc. Um, and one of the things I'm really concerned about is the idea that perhaps we're getting a little bit frightened to take some risks, to try things with learners, with students, using technologies, not really knowing what's going to happen. 
kind of linked to my previous point about outcomes and, and success. Um, and um, sometimes things don't work. Sometimes you know you have you have um, goals. You must get X number of computers out into the community by April or whatever it is, and that doesn't happen. Is that a failure? Has something else happened instead? Um, so what I would really like us to think about, and challenge you to think about, is the idea that we perhaps need to be adopt a notion of positive risk taking. Kind of yes, we'll keep the funders happy and do the best we can, but sometimes we need to be creative. You know, think about the possibilities, try stuff, not knowing if it's going to work. So that will mean you have to build in what I call organisational slack. You know, a group, a community, a school, a centre might have to build in some slack whereby the failures get tolerated in the hope that there'll be some successes, however you define that. So that's my kind of challenge for you today. Um, I'm wearing pink, um, but I'm not the magic digital inclusion fairy. Um, but, but today, think about the challenges. We're all passionate about digital inclusion, whatever that means. Um, but let's make it realistic, and let's think, keep learners at the centre of it. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over to Arthur now. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> so you're just coming up to it now. Okay. 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 So, um, um, thank you for having all of you here. Um, I'm very happy to be here because I'm blind myself and uh, went through the learning system in Germany. In Germany. And um, for me it's quite important that, um, others, that other people that have disabilities have the same chances with me to um, be successful at school and learning a lot to be able to cope with challenges through life and um, being able to make their career despite their disabilities. And uh, so, um, yeah, my role today is not about speaking about me myself, it's more about what I'm doing in, at my work time at Yahoo. So, my role, it's titled Subtle Weird, probably for the most people, it's called Accessibility Evangelist at Yahoo. And the background is really, I was working, or I started Yahoo three years ago, and I was working on all different kinds of tasks. Um, this, as a software engineer, so I was able to work on any kind of back-end engineer, but on usability tasks as well. And I encountered a lot of problems with accessibility. So accessibility with product that I was working on and I could have a change on it, but as well on other products that I didn't get any, any um, yeah, hand on, or if I could change it a little bit, it probably broke again after I changed it because most of the product designers, the product managers, the um, software developers didn't know enough about accessibility. And um, so, I started to um, yeah, to evangelize everyone around me to think about accessibility to make it part of their their work um, attitude and uh, to train people as well. So that's why I now have half and a half um, role where I usually work on accessibility, train people, convince people outside of my reporting line, and. Um, and try to to promote accessibility internally quite strongly, <coughs> and that's why I got such a title. Um, myself, I'm blind. Um, probably you noticed my accent. So I'm Portuguese, born in Germany, living in UK for three years. So it's quite international, and um, 
Yeah, that's my, that's my background. So I have education in Germany, in German and Portuguese. And now in the UK, it's, it's quite interesting and amazing to see how the difference are in learning and uh, yeah, and um, seeing it as well at work. So um, I'm going through a little bit it's only to how we are addressing the things at Yahoo. And um, I'm going very fast through. So who, who is res responsible for accessibility and where are the, the, the yeah, the cutting points between all the systems. And I noticed that it's not all about the engineers itself. It's a whole, whole system that overlaps with accessibility. And we have to be aware of what the things we're doing there. And probably it's the same with uh, creating learning material. So everything is connected to each other, like internationalization, so subtitling. Um, it's the same. Uh, challenge as for making <coughs> videos accessible, making it increase the user experience, um, a lot of different other things, testing, QA, and so on, are all connected somehow to accessibility. And accessibility is like a cross cutting point through all these systems. It's not all about having a good engineer working on a particular thing. And having this in mind, we, we changed it to the way we are working on accessibility. I thought first, why, why are we doing and thinking about accessibility? And uh, one, one major point is really human right, and this reflects really in the to think about the users that are using our pages and probably are your pupils or your students as well with a lot of different kinds of accessible um, disabilities. And um, all of these persons with disabilities um, have not have at least as formally as well the human right on accessibility or um, because accessibility is part of the rights for people with disabilities that you have set up um, uh, quite recently and um, for Yahoo as a private company there's one article that basically says you, not only the public, not only the schools, not only the public sector in general um, the counts of the boroughs are entitled to provide accessibility, but as well the private sector, because they are providing a lot of different kind of information that everyone relies on. Reading mails, uh, having mailing lists, um, reading news, um, taking care of the finances, doing online banking. There's a lot of things people with disabilities have to do online, and they rely on accessibility. Otherwise, they would be excluded, and that's very fundamental. So it's as well, um, a social responsibility of a company to do it right and uh, think about it. And Yahoo started quite recently when I joined, basically, with a small team in Europe and a couple of few other um, colleagues that are disabled or are quite interested in the accessibility. And so we started a way of changing small bits of code to make a proper concept and uh, going it through through. But there's a lot of things to change. So, um, because yeah, it was quite old for the, for the web. So if we start in 1994, we have a lot of products, a lot of code, lines of code already written. They have to be reviewed, changed, and so on. It doesn't happen overnight. But the, the interesting thing that we have seen is, it's not only uh, person with disabilities that have the benefits. Um, we notice that a lot of people that are older are benefiting, for example, Silver Surface, that um, are still using the web or started to use the web. And other countries where we, for example, are, we have a, a user base of uh, 55 plus of 20%, for example, in Japan. And probably it's getting the same in the uh, Western world as well, that the user base is uh, is a Uh, it's going on, so um, still, though it's it's getting more and more an issue for being making a, a business. And another point is to see how we are using the web, so mobile and such on. So we're using it everywhere, and all these different challenges we have are the same that we uh, probably a person with disability has, and that's probably the same with teaching, learning. So when we are learning somewhere on. Um, uh, 
outside of the classroom, the, the way someone is learning probably changing as well. So thinking of lectures on the iPod as podcasts, for example. So when we are looking at um, and, uh, accessibility detail, we look into the guidelines. I'm only rushing through the guidelines because they are, they are public, they are made by the web uh, consortium uh, making the web application things accessible. And I think the same system, <coughs> the basic ideas apply really on the same way for learning materials. So making learning material perceivable, it's the same for us, for you to make news perceivable, that you can read the news, that you can read the last stock quotes and so on. The same thing is with overall. So if you're looking at interaction, um, it's, it's a key part of learning to have interaction, to do a hands-on. It's really to how do we do the learning material accessible? And for us, it's really how to make it that way that someone can access, for example, a currency converter or any kind of interaction with an application. And another quite important point for learning is making it understandable. To break it down in small pieces that everyone understands it. And the same applies for, for making the web accessible, to make it easy to understand and use the right language for the audience and uh, making it that way accessible. And the last really part of making things accessible is really to make it robust, to think about how it's standard and how can I provide it to you with assessive technology and provide learning material in different ways, not only in a PDF that only can be seen on screen, but as well can be read with a screen reader, or someone can turn the pages only by uh, using the uh, movement of the head, and so on. And going through this system and looking how we want to check things if they are accessible, and that's one part that probably teachers have to make the material accessible. The same applies for how is our software accessible, how is our web accessible, and how we can change things. And as a software engineer, basically we do unit tests. We use different kind of um, test tools that probably someone is using as well for making web content accessible. And we're using um, very, very common open source um, tools like, like a wave toolbar, checking online tests for visual impairment like color tests, uh, how would a child or a baby see the colors, and especially if you're in, working in the nursery and doing a very, very basic uh, about, um, yeah, learning about things, it's quite important to know how our color seen and how can I provide information. And for us, it's as well quite important to provide information that way that everyone can access our information and use our services. And we have the automated test as well with <coughs> common tools, but they're quite software engineering, so I will skip them. <coughs> and another thing that's quite important, and probably it's quite important for you as a teacher that probably can't afford a screen reader, there's an open source screen reader called NVDA, there's the URL for it. You can, it's running on um, Windows, Windows XP and Windows 7, and it's quite interesting to see how someone who's blind can use the screen reader, especially if you have first um, experience to have a, um, a blind uh, pupil or a blind student, it's, uh, to learn to yourself how the person is really using a screen reader and how does it feel like. And it's a very, very um, affordable way to use an open, free screen reader for testing yourself. And uh, we are doing the same test as well. We are using such an open source screen reader to testing our own software, our own search system, and so on. And um, so the, the last, uh, uh, well, almost finishing now my presentation is where our accessibility chat tests are working and how we. Um, do the awareness trainings for people that have the decisions on getting content that is accessible, uh, making decisions about the architecture of a software to make it accessible, and how everything started. And um, we started three years ago with a voluntary group of probably five engineers in Europe to make a small change. And now this system, this idea of having a small team that is a task force and can be accessed and the information can be accessed 
is now spreading through here. We have now one in, in our headquarters in, in Sunnyvale, we have one now in Bangalore, and we are um, in, yeah, combining our forces globally as well to be a, a key point for information. And I think this could be a, um, a good idea as well for university or school to have um, persons that are quite savvy in doing this material accessible to uh, have them in access and know who they are and um, and probably talk to them because probably they have already seen the problems and already found a solution for such problems and it makes their life much much easier and probably the same system we are using like the global task forces to the global task forces probably to create such a network between universities and schools of persons that have a deep knowledge about making learning material accessible because this was a system that would be used and is quite successful throughout. And additionally to the ideas we did have in Europe, and um, we are quite lucky because uh, the people in Europe, at least the people that are uh, working in here in Europe, are quite aware about accessibility. It probably is based on the British DDA law where I'm very glad that it exists in, in UK. So everyone, every engineer already stumbled about accessibility in, in UK. And it's a little bit different in outside of, of Europe. So what we did is we created an accessibility lab in US first with all kinds of different gadgets to make things accessible. So single click devices, um, particular kind of keyboards uh, for for, um, for for showing people how someone is, uh, someone can create um, uh, to create. Yeah, my 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 pickup is starting. Um, um, how to make things accessible? It's not all about being blind. That's quite a key important thing because a lot of people that are working on accessibility are blind. But um, it's not all about being blind, and this, this accessibility labs are quite important to show such things. And so we created one in Bangalore as well, because there are a lot of people, a lot of engineers working there, and it's quite important that they have seen the first time someone being able to use a computer only by moving the head or only moving the eyes. Yes, and now can you cancel the screen interaction? It's going to back itself up. Okay, there were some automatic processes started. Okay, but I think you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm done. I'm basically done. Anyway. So I'm testing if everyone is away. <laughs> so and um, yeah. So this is my contact details, and I hope I didn't run too much of the time. And, uh, perfect timing, thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Uh, I didn't explain at the beginning, we'll be allowing time for questions at the end, so okay. we're just going to swap over between Arthur and Donald now. to the mid-80s 
in the Republic of Ireland, which was possibly as bleak a time as we, we have now, economically and everything else. And at that particular point, I remember this vividly actually, there was one of our public libraries, the main public library, in what was then a new shopping centre, got a reading machine. It was called a Kurzweil reading machine. And there are some pictures of these things on the internet. And I remember, again, I remember you going in and using it a couple of times just to, to read little books and things as a teenager. And it was amazing because this thing was the size of a washing machine. And the keyboard that you used was a huge keyboard with big rubber buttons. And the keyboard probably weighed more than two laptops. But the interesting thing was that in 90s, 1980s Ireland, this machine, I can't remember the exact figure, it was either £30,000 in pounds at the time, or 70000 so it possibly cost as much as a house. And it was revolutionary in the sense that for the first time, certainly for many of us in Ireland at that stage, we could then read books. We could go in, put a piece of paper down, and read it. Now, I was, I was a teenager, so I didn't have a lot of priority on this particular device. Jump forward. And in 1991, I became the first science student to start an ultimately completed degree in computer science in, in Ireland. And at that particular time, again, the university, DCU, uh, where, I'm, where I'm now teaching, uh, was very, very willing to purchase equipment, but didn't really know what to buy. So at that point, we did some investigation and some other colleagues in the industry were most helpful and we purchased Scanning software. Scanner, put up to a PC, which again, read books. And it's very interesting to look at it because that scanning software, again, it had come down at that point. It only cost four thousand pounds a month. Which again in 1991 Ireland was, was a hell of a lot of money. Now what's very interesting about all of this, we then take a, a another sidetrack, and we say Screen reading devices, you know, we can start looking from the development of the IBM screen reader in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and we had speed synthesis incorporated into that. So we look at inclusion, and we consider now in 2010 where these devices have come from and are going to. These devices were designed for blind people. Speed synthesis was primarily designed for use with blind, blind people. There's other obviously applications and uses for it. So I actually think if we look at inclusion, we blind people have actually been very, very generous in passing on our technology to you sighted people. <laughs> so if you look, for example, I mean I'm sure, let's do a warmer response. How many of you have GPS systems in your cars? Yeah, yeah. quite a few. Relying on speed synthesis. That has crossed the digital divide from the world of blind people to the world of sighted people. How many of you scan photographs into whatever computer you happen to use? I'm sure quite a few of you. Other technology that has crossed the divide from blind people to sighted people. So we can look at this two ways. We can say that inclusion is a one-way street whereby accessibility comes from the sighted to the blind. Or we can look at it as a two-way street, which is that it's a mutually beneficial experience. That is very evident by recent trends in mobile phone development um, and other talking devices. Um, my mobile phone of choice is the iPhone. And it's a very, very interesting device for, for lots of reasons. It started off, I think it's safe to say that, that, that the iPhone has pretty much revolutionized the way people use phones and view the internet on, on, on mobile devices. And Latterly, in about the last year or so, Apple has built into this device technology which means that off the shelf, I as a blind person can walk into whatever network actually carries the phone and buy the iPhone. I don't need extra hardware, I don't need extra software, I can enable assistive technology on my device. Now this is a huge step forward because until now, <coughs> blind users of mobile technology had to rely on third party software which cost a lot of money. So you could go in and theory and buy a phone on whatever contract you happen to be, running the Symbian operating system for maybe 75, 80, 85 pounds. 
You then have to go to somebody else and spend 150 or 200 pounds to make it speak to you. So the cost of actually doing this was, was, was prohibitive, was putting people off. Now we have a situation where it's built into the device. Why is this useful for sighted people? It's useful because well, I, have, I have certain friends who, for example, actually like the interaction that the, 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 the technology actually provides. Voice recognition on the phone, they use it while driving. So it's a two-way street. Now, so we can say that computer science so far has done pretty well. It has enabled blind people and those with disabilities. I'm afraid I focus mainly on blind, on, on the issue of blindness because I am totally blind myself. But you should remember that there are other disabilities out there who have benefited and who indeed, who, the, the development of, of technology who have actually contributed to the development of mainstream technology. But if we look now, at learning environments. Learning is one area, I feel, where inclusion is still problematic. Classroom situations can be dealt with. We have just completed a project um, called the Abitet Project, A-H-V-I-T-E-D, the Abitet Project, which aimed to provide independent access to graphic <coughs> material. Uh, us, ourselves at DCU, and a number of EU partners were very much involved in developing and evaluating some systems for the production of what are called audio tactile diagrams. In effect, a diagram, a tactile diagram is printed on uh, chemical sheet paper, it's called swell paper, that's then put on a touch screen, and the student can, can feel the, the raised image and can press on it and get trigger audio feedback. Now, this is fine and it works very, very well in the classroom situation. I have several systems out there which actually have proven this fact. <coughs> the issue with all of this is that in an independent scenario, which in many cases we're moving towards, this kind of technology is problematic. How, for example, I mean, we did a little experiment last week uh, where we handed some, we didn't have blind people, so we, 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 we blindfolded inside of people and just handed them uh, piece of paper with images on there. And the image was several concentric circles <coughs> with a, a large filled in oval in the middle. And as one man put it, he said, this could be planetary orbits, it could be absolutely anything. And he opened his eyes, it was actually a picture of the human eye. <coughs> now, the interesting thing about this is that for many blind people, it's just circles. And you just press on different parts and you actually get the information back. But it's an example of the problems that actually exist for you as teachers to try and incorporate inclusion and accessibility into your classrooms. Many of you, I'm sure, are now dealing with e-learning platforms such as, for example, Moodle, Blackboard, any of these kind of e-learning platforms. How do you, particularly in disciplines such as science, geography, computer science, anything which relies on diagrams, how do you provide that kind of access to people who are blind? And we are, I can give people more information on the, the projects we're working on this offline. But this is an issue which prevents, in many cases, blind people going on to further education. There was a report published some years ago by an organisation in Ireland called AHEAD, who represents students in third level education, student with disabilities. And they noted that blind people were very, very underrepresented in the sciences, particularly in Ireland. People were not going into computer science, not going into, into mathematics, not going into anything, because of the lack of access. So we need, I think, to look very carefully at the role that technology plays in creating inclusive classrooms and inclusive, independent e-learning platforms for blind people. I think it's something that's lagging a little bit behind. The iPod, as Art mentioned in his presentation, is a very, again, back to that, is a very, very interesting device. It provides a mechanism where you can deliver content in very, very many different ways. Here's an example. You have an in-class situation. You're presenting information to people who can see. Now, an obvious mistake, they can print it out and bring it with them on uh, in paper, in paper or in a PDF or, or, or whatever. 
Using the iPod, very simply, you can generate audio versions. Multiple MP3, maybe one MP3 per page of a, of a set of overheads. Create a little playlist and just download the lesson to an iPod. The binder can then bring that with them and work away in exactly the same way as somebody signing can. It's the use of technology. It's very simple to do, it's just thinking slightly outside the box. One of the major challenges I think that actually still remains though is we're now moving into a point where it's e-learning, whether it is interfaces generally, where interfaces are becoming much more what I would describe as busy. Again, if we go back to the mid 90s, you know, you had DOS, the old DOS based computers, or as Jay mentioned, I actually learned my first computer was, it was BBC Micro. And at that point, you had one operation, one, one program that was focusing your attention, it was character based, and everything was on a level playing, level playing field. Then Windows 95 came along. At that point, you could have two things open at the same time. Now, you tended to focus on one the screen, you know, you, you could flip very easily. It was also graphical. That posed a challenge. That challenge has been surmounted. Now we've moved on to the fact where we're using things like Ajax, and ARIA, and lots of web-based interfaces and widgets doing different things on the screens. Screens are becoming very, very busy. Now visually, you can do some very interesting things to say, this application, this portion of your screen needs your attention. But if you have three or four of those things actually going on at the same time, that's going to pose a problem for anybody using certainly the audio channel. You can, you can listen to several voices at the same time, but the concentration levels and the perception levels <coughs> diminish the more channels you actually are trying to process. So I think what interfaces and computing needs to do now is to look, if you will, at how to give the user very much more control over their interface. In other words, here's, here's the analogy I'll give you, and I'm very coming to the end of this. Imagine you're going into a supermarket and you want to buy some biscuits. So you walk in, and the first thing you do is you look for the aisle that sells biscuits. Then you walk along and you, as side of people, can scan the entire array of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of brands of biscuits that actually exist on that shelf. Now, if you're blind, and I can tell you this from personal experience, when you walk into that store, you can do the first bit, if you're like, you're selecting from a high level menu, you say to the, the, the person who's guiding you around Tesco's or Astro or wherever, please bring me to the business aisle. Then when you get to the business, business aisle, what do you do? Do you stand there for three hours listing out every single brand? This is the issue that actually faces us, that there's so much data now that actually has to be filtered out. And I think the interfaces need to actually go through a paradigm shift in terms of what actually is filtered out, not what's provided, but giving the user the opportunity to filter things out rather than actually be all inclusive. And this very much applies to your own learning scenarios because if you have lesson plans that involve videos and maybe animations and text, so you've got a video playing on your screen and you've got text describing that video going on the same web page and then maybe you've got questions at the bottom of that web page where the student actually has to answer. The answer to those questions is based, of course, on the text and the video, which is both playing simultaneously, and all of that is trying to be fed through a stream view through audio. You've got a problem. For the simple reason that no the student is going to waste very valuable cognitive effort on understanding what's going on, actually absorbing the information. They won't be able to process the information. So an example would be, supposing you have a mathematical equation and you're trying to present that to a student in audio, I don't know whether we have any maths teachers actually here who have tried to do this. <coughs> we are working at the moment on a way of actually presenting mathematics using Braille and using synthetic speech. Again, if anybody's interested, I won't bore you with the details, but if anybody's interested, do please feel free to talk to me offline. Now, if you have a student who's trying to remember, listen to an equation, they get one shot, A plus B over C plus D plus E minus F plus G. That's it, that's all they get. And they've got to try and remember that and then work out what the equation actually means. Same scenario applies to the very, very busy interface I just alluded to a second ago. So my challenge for you today, my thoughts for you today would be this. In order to foster inclusion in your classrooms, think about the fact that not everybody absorbs information to the rise of the visual cortex. We all use every single sense that we have at our disposal, even subconsciously. 
But when you're designing your lessons and your lesson plans, just be aware that if you can actually keep your stream of information simple, keep the flow of information simple, and give the user the control over the information. So in other words, let them give them time to review the text several times with the screen reader, slightly slower, play the video again, and not have too many things going on simultaneously. I think you will find that the inclusivity in your classrooms and in your e-learning environments, which in turn will foster the independence and the independent learning that is necessary in the 2010 uh, academic culture, I think you will find that you will develop more inclusive uh, and more appropriate learning content for your, for your students, irrespective of whether they have a disability or they don't. Thank you very much indeed. Donna, thank you very much indeed. So we have time for questions, comments, reflections um, to all three of us who spoke. Um, so Anne is up first. Okay. Okay, question to um, Arthur. Um, I think you didn't get to this in, in time in your, in your talk. Um, given, I, I see accessibility as having two halves, really. There's the product-oriented um, half, where you do your best to make this accessible to some kind of idea of people that you um, have in your head. And then there's the user-oriented uh, Perspective where one might talk about you know what 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 individuals require from systems um, and really I, I see the whole thing as some kind of um, relationship um, between uh, those two halves and, and and various ways exist to sort of balance those two halves and to actually manage that relationship. Uh, so, uh, you know, one way is to uh, select a number of users and, and a sample of users and, 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 and test things, you know, was this uh, accessible to you? Another way, um, focusing particularly at the, uh, at the user end, uh, is, is to deal with profiles of, of user requirements, a little bit like the, the, the sort of profiles you fill in when you, when you sign up for a Yahoo account or a Google account. Uh, my experience is that these don't really handle accessibility yet. Um, I kind of wondered what, if you could say something about efforts uh, uh, that Yahoo make, how they actually balance that, that relationship. Um, we, we have a, a, well, a special group, it's called Youth Experience Designers. Oh, is it a microphone? Is that loud enough? Okay. Um, and the basic idea there is really to do the user test, as you mentioned, and to create Oh, thank you. Um, but we have a special group called User Experience Designers, and they are um, doing the user test at the beginning and uh, when the product is further scrolling out. And I'm quite in co close contact with this group because a lot of concepts that are important for the usability are part of accessibility as well and especially the early designs of, or graphical designs to make the things appealing are quite important for accessibility for making aware of uh, graphical or um, color contrasts and are the symbols big enough that they can be used by someone who can't navigate the mouse very well. But there are some cases where, where it's um, some you know, disagreement and sometimes the accessibility is helping you, the experience designers, to break their tasks down to a particular workflow because from the point of view of accessibility, it's really about getting a task done in a very short time and not how does it look like nice to find the next next step for the task. And sometimes this, this close work together is quite, quite um, um, fruitful, I think, for both sides to, to learn about users that don't have accessibility, uh, disability problems, how they experience the web, and how we can include accessibility into it. Thanks. It's a learning process at the moment. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, reflections? Yes. I was, I was very interested in this point that was made about um, making 
switch the mic on? It's on. Okay. It's on. Hello? Yeah. I was very interested in the point about um, that was made about making learning content uh, more or less a single stream rather than um, multimedia. Um, do you think there is a conflict between uh, e-technologists who are constantly being asked to make their um, content interactive, as interactive as possible, and the, the concept of accessibility for all learners? Question for you, John, I think. No, I, I don't. Um, I, I think, again, I, I would describe it as, uh, it's a hobby horse of mine actually, it happened for many years, different views of the same data. Um, in the sense that there's, there's no reason, I mean, if, if, if you have content that is properly designed, uh, and if you like, it is, you have a content that is separated from how it is viewed, um, then there's no reason that for people who, who are not blind, for example, um, you can't have a view of it which is, which is very, very possibly flash-based or possibly very, very graphical in nature. However, if you've got people who, who, who obviously can't see the graphics, then there's no reason that same information can't be presented but in a different way. Um, there is a slight issue in the sense that um, many things now are actually happening, as, as I said in my talk, simultaneously. And you're right, that does pose a problem. But I go back to what I said in the sense of that the ability in assistive technology to actually filter that information out is becoming, I think, much more, more and more essential um, to, in, in order to actually use yeah. modern interfaces. Thank you. Let it the back in pink. Um, I'd just like to agree with what Donald said there. I think if you adopt a design for diversity or a design for all approach, I think you can create accessible interfaces which are better for people who don't have disabilities as well. And it's really just making a cultural change so that people do design for diversity rather than for some average person who doesn't have any disabilities but it is going to be a cultural change that is quite difficult to achieve and something that I hope everybody in this room will, you know, is committed to spreading amongst our colleagues. Thank you. I think that's certainly a really interesting point. You, there was two phrases that you used there, kind of design for diversity, design for all, and kind of linking into my message earlier about challenging conceptualisations. What does design for all mean? And is that the same as designing for diversity? I think that's a real challenge for us to think about. Before Andy has a second go, anybody else? Really yes, the Hi, Lisa Cotzell, University of Morgan. I, I just wanted to make a, a general point, um, and also following on from the, the comments about designing for diversity. I think there is, a, um, you know, a, a lot of people who, who work in this kind of area uh, who may themselves not be disabled, but want to do the right thing, sometimes uh, mistakenly assume that designing for all means one size fits all. And that's a huge mistake because Every person is going to use technology in a different way. Um, the way that I use my mobile phone may be completely different to the way my friend uses exactly the same model of phone. So the key is to design for flexibility and to have multiple ways of using the same thing or accessing the same data so that one person who may um, respond very well um, to flash-based, very visual, very um, interactive uh, way of using something, uh, so the person sitting next to them may, may need to use exactly the same piece of equipment or the same software but in a completely different way. So the key should be designing for diversity, meaning uh, flexible, multiple ways of accessing something, of using something, rather than a one-size-fits-all because there is no average person. Uh, and if we do try to design for an average person, Everyone loses out. 
No, that is that's the thing uh, designed for diversity, giving the user control, making your system flexible so that the user can exert control over it. John, Arthur, do you want to respond at all to your conceptions of what design drawing means? I think the idea of um, making design for diversity, for diversity is a key point because it's it's really the way of the a content or or the web page or learning information is accessible in a different way is reflecting as well the way of how many devices you can now use for accessing the learning experience because now we can access the information on the go um, where we don't have a huge screen where five or six um, frames are fitting into it where you can observe um, a lot of information at the same time. Um, sometimes now you can get the information on TV with a low resolution so you can't get the same information the way away. Probably you don't have a mouse pointer on it. So the way people are interacting with learning material, with the web, is changing completely and the providers of such information have to think about diversity not only in case of different kind of users but different kind of um, using devices and different ways and, and situations where someone is using it. This was one part where I said it's quite important for us as well to think about situative disabilities Everyone has a particular situation, a particular disability, depending on the circumstances. So, by thinking about that someone is able to use the, the web application on the go, on the, while driving and so on, it's quite important to know, to, to, to provide the information in the way that is suitable for the situation. And being able, for example, to increase the contrast when it's sunny um, and some things. Very briefly, um, the analogy again. I'll go back to my, my, my GPS analogy that I made in my in my, uh, in my presentation. Um, a phrase that's come into uh, UI design recently, user interface design recently, is the notion of a person being what's called situation blind. In other words, they're in a situation where looking at the screen, looking at the, the UI, is simply not possible. The classic example of that, of course, is something like a GPS and an in-car solution. You really don't want to be looking at a map or trying to be navigating around both at the same time. So, given that, um, the design for all approach of having a device which speaks actually works. Now, on my mobile phone, I actually have a GPS solution, which is an off-the-shelf GPS solution because it is designed using Apple's uh, standard graphical Windows uh, using you know, Cocoa framework, um, means that it's accessible to voiceover, to the screen reader on the iPhone. So I can type in the address I'm looking for. I can look for the, the points of interest around me, etc. And then I can use the system in exactly the same way as somebody who can see. The only additional thing is that I have my voice over screen reader enable, enabled. So the sighted user will tap in the address, maybe using a slightly different interaction on the keyboard, but the same effective workflow, if you want to call it that, is actually being followed. That, that would be the example that I would use to describe it. Thank you. I've been told I need to finish at eight minutes past, so I think Andy, if you'll forgive me, I'll stop here. Um, and I'd like you all to thank our speakers. I think we've had a really interesting start to the morning. So thank you very much.